All right, folks, it's just me. No bells and whistles this week, but welcome to Tour Life. It's Tuesday, July 16th, and we got a good show for you today. Like I said, it is just me, solo dolo, a couple things. Silas, on vacation, gone, deuces. Do we need to find maybe a producer that can jump in and produce the couple weeks that he's gone, sick? Potentially, we'll work on that. Yuli, uh, doctor's appointment, more to come with that next week. So stay tuned for that. So you just got me this week. We're going to be breaking it all down. Kristen Tatar picks up right where she left off, taking down uh, the tournament, coming back from her injury. We got Ricky showing his dominance, going into a major. What does that mean? We're going to break down the European Open, give you a little preview of that. And then we have a little bit of a wild story. To be fair, I did rip this off. Uh, from Reddit, so shout out to my guys over at Reddit. Uh, if you're not over on our disc golf, go check it out. A lot of cool stories pop up over there. But before we get into the show, quick shout out to our guys over at Discraft. Not only do they sponsor me and Yuli, but they also help this show out and they help you out right here with 15% off code right now, TourLife15 at Team Discraft's website. That's teamdiscraft.com. Go over there, use the discount code TORLIFE15, pick up a Captain's Raptor, pick up a Captain's Thrasher, pick up a Luna, pick up a Get Freaky, pick up whatever you want, 15% off with the code TORLIFE15. Now, this week for me was a kind of a chill week. I'm still just in the Dallas area getting uh, some practice in, watching the boys. Kelsey's actually coming back this weekend, so I'm very excited for that. A little family time with all of us. But I got more rounds in this week and uh, got more rounds in with the cart. And I got to tell you guys, the cart is an absolute game changer for me. Now, if I was a young whippersnapper, I probably wouldn't be even thinking about the cart. I would probably just go with the backpack, no problem, whatever. But if you are someone that wakes up the next morning and you're a little sore, give the cart a try. Give it a try. Maybe someone around here locally has an extra one that you can try for a day or two a little test trial see how it is all i can tell you personal experience when i go out play around i can play another round right after that where before i would feel like man i'm done or i would tweak something just try it uh don't hate it and uh if you say carts are lame or that's whack you better be someone that walks when they play golf i don't want to see you in any golf carts at all you better be walking. Because uh, we all know if there was golf carts on disc golf, the majority of us would be using a golf cart. You'd be silly if you weren't. Also, shout out to my boy Bear. Uh, almost 100 rounds between me and him. I think that will be completed probably in the next week or two. We just completed round number 96 together, which is insane. Uh, so we might... I'll probably film a YouTube video of our round 100, and that will be a, a fun little celebration. But let's jump into it. Let's go. There was a big old tournament that happened overseas in Krokol Open. And if you were living in the United States, we were waking up pretty early to watch some of the live footage. But it was certainly worth it. An absolute beautiful course, beautiful landscape. Great crowns, crowds, and actually a pretty good little challenge for most of the players out there. So the venue was perfectly set up for a great tournament. And there was only six rounds in MPO that were under par. So that was very cool to see that it was a pretty challenging course for most people. And we saw people blow up too, which is really, really exciting. You know, I think that's what you really want in a course. Now, are there still... A lot of holes where you're either getting a par or a birdie, sure. But we're starting to slowly move into the realm of where there is a potential of bogeying every hole or at least trying to get holes where you can bogey every hole. And a lot of that has to do with the greens out there. I think they did a great job with the greens, with the trouble around them, the rollaways, the elevation changes. I love to see the different... Um, course design if you will with the greens out there it wasn't just simply let's put a basket in the middle of the field and call it a day so i love to see it now we got to talk about ricky wysocki here the dude played absolutely out of his mind bogey free all three rounds absolutely incredible sets the course record in the first round shooting 13 under 
uh, has an insane second round as well, shooting 12 under, and then was able to kind of just coast a little bit in the third round, shooting eight under. He had a stretch there from eight to 13 where he didn't take a single birdie. Uh, but when you're not making bogeys out there, that's fine. Uh, you don't really have to catch up if you can just get pars and birdies, and he definitely did that this past week. Uh, he's putting really well, 28 from 31 inside of Circle 1X. He only missed nine fairways all weekend. He only threw one disc out of bounds. And in round one, folks, he only missed one green, one C2 in regulation. Uh, that tells you right there that he's literally has a birdie putt on 17 of the 80, 18 holes inside of 66 feet. Absolutely crazy. His game right now is looking good. He's definitely a front runner going into the European Open. Now, Jakob. Jakob actually had a phenomenal tournament as well, finishing in second place, just five shots behind Ricky. Again, Ricky kind of just blew the field away. Um, but Jakob had a great second and third round. He shot 12 under in round two and finished it with a 10, hour, 10 under round three. Now, the only thing that I want to kind of bring up was the decision making on hole 15. I thought it was kind of interesting. It's a par five. It's... Um, you know, pretty birdieable par five, if you will. But the green is a little bit scary. There is risk of potentially rolling, ob uh, potentially rolling away and having to make a longer comeback putt. And uh, I was surprised. He actually did lay up his putt. Uh, luckily, we had the commentary telling us this because for whatever reason, they decided not to show that decision. To me, that was a big miss on the Disc Golf Network. And we'll get into coverage here in a little bit. But you got to show when he has a putt that could potentially keep him at least in, in shooting distance. I mean, obviously, Ricky ended up burning the last five holes, so he basically made it impossible for Jakob to, uh, to catch him. But, you know, if Jakob birdies that hole, there is, a, there is a world that maybe Ricky takes a bogey or something. There is a world that we can look at to where it gets a little bit more exciting. Laying up there was pretty much set in stone. He was pretty much just playing for second place, which... He ended up having by uh, five shots. So it almost was one of those of a, you know, you have almost nothing to lose in that situ situation. Might as well go for the birdie there. Uh, but I could understand maybe just playing a little safe for second. Uh, so I did think that was a little bit interesting of a play there. Um, Vino also had a pretty phenomenal tournament. Kind of struggled there in round uh, three. He shot eight under in round one, ten under in round two, and then struggled there with five under in round three. It did look like the first couple holes on the course played some of the tougher holes. Most guys got off to a pretty slow start. I mean, Ricky, with as many birdies as he had, he only he parred hole one all three rounds. So Vino takes a par bogey double to kind of start his final round, kind of shoots himself in the foot early there to give himself not a chance to even have a contention of running down Ricky, which I don't think anyone would have. Uh, but it is good seeing Vino playing well. Nicholas and Tilla also having a good tournament while finishing fourth. That just shows you right there too. Those three guys. I mean, those are the, when we're talking about European powerhouses. Those are the three that come to mind. Uh, there's a couple other guys that maybe you could throw in there here and there. But to me, those are the three guys: Nicholas, Vino, and Jakob. Those are the guys I'm gonna be looking at as well in the European Open. But good finishes from all three of those finishing. And I gotta give a shout out to jo uh, Joseph Anderson. Um, this guy's been having a great season so far. Really good finishes all along the way. He kind of was up and down a little bit on that final round. Probably didn't finish the way he would have liked to. Shooting five under that final round, taking four bogeys in that final round. But the guy's got a very solid game. If you watch him play, he can throw a backhand forehand. He can throw both angles on hyzer flips and on turnovers. There really isn't a part of his game that I would say is his weakness. If anything, it's just getting more time on the course and putting himself in more of these situations. But that is that is a name that I think it kind of sometimes gets thrown under the radar a little bit with some of the young other younger players on tour, AB, Gannon. Um, he, he's not an old guy by any means. And I think, I think he's going to be sticking around quite some time. So keep an eye on Joseph Anderson. Let's see if he can finally maybe get a W or get close to maybe putting himself in a position to win this year on tour. Paul McBeth with a very nice finish, finishing in sixth place getting just ready for the European Open again a couple years ago. Him, Eagle, absolutely blitzkrieg the entire field out there. So we'll see if he can maybe do the same. And then finishing out the top 10, you have all, all four of these players finishing in seventh place. Adam, 
uh, Paul, Uliberry, AB, and Gannon Burr. Now, Gannon Burr, uh, you can look at this and be like, oh, what happened? He was on lead card. Now he's finishing in seventh. What happened? Well, he played the last three holes in five over par. Or, th sorry, four over par. Uh, tripled the final hole. It kind of looked like once he kind of was out of his mojo, out of his rhythm, um, he kind of just took his foot off the pedal there a little bit. But still a very solid tournament for one of the top players in the world going into a major as well. Got to shout out Jake Wolf as well. Great finish from Jake Wolf finishing in 11th place. Uh, if you don't, if you've never seen Jake Wolf play, that is someone, if you're going out to the European Open, that is someone that you want to keep your eyes on. He is an absolute electric machine just watching him play. Whether he's shooting five over or five under, still a super exciting disc golfer with the types of shots he throws. Eagle McMahon, good finish there for him in 12th. And then going down, we are now lit, we are now kind of getting into a lot of people that, to be honest, I'm not really super familiar with. A lot of European players that don't play. I mean, I know Yona, uh, Peter, I've heard of him before. But a lot of these guys, Rasmus, um, you got Samuel Hananen. I'm going to butcher some of these names, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, we know Canoe, Elias, Roland. There's a lot of names in here that are very unfamiliar to most of us that maybe don't follow the European scene as much as uh, others. Um, but yeah, there you have it. Got a bunch of guys kind of mixed in there. Uh, you know, Big Germ finishing 42nd, James Conrad in 42nd, Bradley Williams, who won this tournament last year with a much weaker field finishing in 35th. And then you have Nate Sexton in there finishing in 32nd. I believe he tried to qualify or was thinking about qualifying for the European Open. Sadly, he did not make it. I don't know if he actually ended up going and qualifying he just wasn't one of the five people in the list that ended up qualifying for the European Open. Uh, a couple other shout outs here. Got to go give one to James Proctor. Did something that I've never seen on live coverage before. He eagled his last two holes that he played. Pretty impressive stuff. He threw in from 200 feet plus on um, hole 17. And then hole 18 is a uh, eagleable hole. And uh, he did just that. Finished it with an eagle. I think this was the end of... Uh, did he do that at the end of round two, I want to say? I'm trying to remember what round that was that he did it in. Might have been the final round, honestly. Or maybe it was the first round. I'm getting my rounds all mixed up. It was the first round. Uh, final round did not... He might have gone for the double eagle again in the final round. Did not work out for him. He went bogey uh, double. So... Yeah. Apologies, but hey, shout out to James Proctor. Not a lot of people can say they've gone uh, eagle, eagle, back to back. So some impressive stuff there. All right, let's fly over to FPO real quick. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was a little bit of a disappointment, I have to say. Now, don't take that as a slight. Chris Tatar, absolutely phenomenal performance. Coming back after weeks of not playing in any tournaments. Comes back right where she left off as the most dominant FPO player that I have ever seen. And probably a lot of people that have been watching disc golf more than I have, have ever seen as well. Beating the field by six shots plus. Really, it was a two-person race here between Silva and Kristen. Kristen finished in first at 16 under. Silva finished in second at 10 under. And then jumps all the way to five under in third place. So it was really just those two. And I got, again, I got to give some credit here to Silva she put up a good fight. I mean, she came out there. There was a lot of talk about how is she going to perform when Kristen's actually in the field. Well, she went out and she led the, the tournament after round one and then also led the tournament with Kristen after round two. Now, I kind of hyped up who's going to be waking up at, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning to watch the battle between Kristen and Silva. The battle was there. Silva actually did pick up a couple strokes. In the first four holes, Silva picked up two shots on Kristen and had a two-shot lead after the first four. But then after that, just kind of leaked it away. Lost a stroke on hole five. Lost two strokes on hole seven. Lost a stroke on eight. Lost a stroke on nine. And at that point, it was pretty much set in stone that Kristen was going to take it down. I mean, looking at Kristen's stats, absolutely insane here. She led the field in birdie uh, percentage at 44. Bogey percentage only at 15%. Zero double bogeys. Hidden 80% of fairways, 20% parked, 44% C1, 74% C2 in reg, 86% C1 in X, and had 27. I mean, I'm not even going to count strokes gained because there's a bunch of people. I mean, there's there's people shooting 59 over in this tournament. So I'm, I'm not 
Shokes Gaines is a terrible stat. I always say it's a terrible stat until we have an actual field of all professional disc golfers. Uh, we can't be having people that are shooting 60 shots off the lead. That's just absolutely ridiculous, and that is going to skew the numbers. Um, but like I said, Silva looked like uh, she was kind of ready for the task after the first two. And really, this was the first time that I've seen her kind of put in that position. So it'll be very interesting to see how she responds the next time because there definitely will be a next time. She is starting to kind of push herself as one of the top people. And you might say, hey, well, this was over in Europe. There's not a lot of people over there. Uh, no, you would be incorrect. You have a lot of people over there. Uh, Anakin, who has won a tournament, was over there. Heidi Lane, who's a really solid player, was over there. You have Ella Hansen, who has won a tournament, was over there. Um, Paige Pierce also was in the field. So there was solid players. Uh, now, was it super deep? Absolutely not. But you got to look at Silva as potentially right now in my book from what I have seen of her over the last several weeks. I have to think that she is the best person that could push Kristen Tatar right now. So it'll be interesting to see how that all goes moving in to the European Open. And I just have to say it, guys. The FPO right now runs through Europe. The FPO absolutely runs through Europe. And it'll be interesting to see how United States, um, just to see how it kind of goes over the year. I mean, right now, the Europeans on the MPO side are trying to catch up to the Americans on the MPO side. And uh, it's absolutely flipped in FPO. Uh, the best players in the world are all in Europe on FPO. And so we'll see if, uh, if some of these other Americans can start kind of making a little bit of run for themselves. All right, we're going to go on to coverage now. A uh, couple things here. Firstly, the course is incredible. So that is a huge advantage when we're looking at the actual course itself. Massive advantage to have those backdrops and all that to use uh, for, you know, to make the course look as beautiful as it does, right? But there's a couple concerns I have here. A couple concerns here. First thing, they got to stop showing the whole preview after the players have already thrown. The, the setting up to certain holes, and this is where, you know, it's unfortunate Yuli isn't here because he actually played the course. This is where there is a massive disconnect, guys, between people that have played the course and people that haven't played the course. And this was one of the first tournaments in a while that I watched a lot of live coverage without actually have ever played the course. And I got to be honest, there's a lot of holes that I was completely clueless on what the hole was and what they're trying to do. Um, it's a brand new course for me. I'm not going to remember all 18 holes. And honestly, there's a lot of holes out there that kind of blend in a little bit. So it, it's tough to be like, oh yeah, hole blah, blah, is that hole. There's a couple, but the majority kind of blend in. And so I was kind of a little bit surprised that they would do these hole previews and they would explain the hole after all the players have already thrown. It's too late. And this is where I really think it's important for the Disc Golf Pro Tour to move forward. The production side of things and telling a story needs to get better on the live side. Right now, you have a lot of diehard people that will pretty much watch anything. I mean, heck, go back and watch some of the coverage that Terry did, right? I mean, hats off to him. He wasn't getting paid to do it. He was just doing it to try to get disc golf out there. But as far as like the production goes, uh, you know, he's just out there kind of with a mic maybe on his phone and filming with his phone, but people are watching it. Those are the diehard people. We're trying to get a smaller uh, or a bigger audience that aren't the diehards to pay attention. And you're only going to do that with storylines throughout the coverage. And that's the one thing that I really kind of missed. It's, it was just shots, 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 commercial, 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 downtown, downtown, downtime, downtime, shot, shot. It didn't really flow that well for me. And one thing that I think that they're not utilizing well at all, and they have to start utilizing this, is it's okay to have a tape delay. There aren't that many people that are watching on like the scores on their phone. They really aren't. And I think right now there is a little bit of a concern because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 
the scoring that they have, that they show le the leaderboards and all that stuff, that is just connected live. So they're pulling that from something. So that way, if they are showing a tape delay of someone putting, it will already say that they're 10 under, even though you're like, wait, I thought they were nine under. It's because they already had made the putt, even though it's on tape delay, if that makes sense. So I'm wondering if that's why they're not doing it because tape delay showing stuff 30 seconds after it happened, we don't know that. You know, you can always say, oh, a little bit earlier, this went down and show us, and we're not gonna care all that much. And especially if you can set up a hole, if you can set up the drama, if you can set up, oh my gosh, you don't wanna go left here, it's super, super tricky over here. Set up the shot and then have the shot shown and catch up in live if you want to doing other stuff. But uh, that's something that I just kind of, and again, it goes back to, this is just stuff that golf does that I think disc golf could certainly look at and emulate. I think it would work a lot well. Um, other thing that I thought was interesting is I understand we're in Europe, we're playing the European tour, but most viewers, I believe, for the Disc Golf Network are Americans. So I thought it was very weird that they were using meters and they were using it exclusively. They would never tell you how much feet it was. They would never, on the screen, they wouldn't say 100 meters slash 337 feet or whatever it is. It, would, it was all in meters. And so that was another thing that kind of disconnected me a little bit. Of, I have no idea how far these holes are. I don't know when you're telling me someone throws 420 meters, I don't really have a good gauge of how far that is. Um, so I might b have butchered all of those, uh, <laughs> of those uh, measurements there, but you get my gist. So that was something that I thought was really interesting. And then the last thing too is, what happened to using the people on the ground? I thought J JVD tweeted me the other time saying, oh, we've been doing this forever. We've been using the people on the ground all the time to, to set up shots and to talk about the shots and do all the commentary. I didn't hear from Terry at all. Like it was very few and it was going back to the same thing. Oh, Terry, is that disc out of bounds? Oh, Terry, did you see where that disc landed? Oh, Terry versus Terry telling the story because he is live on the ground. And I get it. If you're going to come at me and say, well, that's technology. It's super hard to do that. We got to find a way around it. I don't know. We got to find a way around it. All right, let's jump into our European Open preview here. It's going down this upcoming week. We got the President's Cup going down on Wednesday, which we'll preview here in a second. But the big changes for this is we're going to a new course. Instead of playing the Beast in Nokia for uh, all the for the entire tournament, we're doing two course uh, two courses now. We're going to Tampere, Tampere, I believe is the now. We're playing there for the first two days, and then the third and final round will be back at the Beast in Nokia. Um, so that should be a nice little change of pace. I've been told that the course is long, tight, technical. So it's gonna be a nice mixture. It's gonna almost kind of feel like a world championship, honestly. And I believe the world championship is going to be held there next year, which is gonna be interesting because it's already a major. Uh, but again, like I said before, I, you gotta look at Ricky Wysocki as one of the favorites going into this tournament. If you don't look at his past major performances. And it's kind of crazy. I dug into this a little bit. You guys will hear this more on debate night on Thursday, but I looked at some of these statistics and it was kind of surprising. You look at how he finished at the one major this year, Champions Cup, he was seven shots off the lead after round one. Then you go last year, you look at how he did at USDGC, he finished 11th, solid, but he was eight shots back after round one. Worlds, he finished 12th, he was seven shots back after round one. Six at European Open last shot last year. He was six back after round one. The only tournaments, um, the only tournaments in these in the past like eight majors that he really has kind of been close to is USDGC in 2022. He led after round one and round two, and uh, th in the third round um, he shot plus one, dropping nine spots behind elite. 
So he had two great rounds, and then third round just absolutely got obliterated. F ended up finishing seventh. Worlds in 2022, he finished 11th. He was six back after round one. European Open, he finished 12th. He was eight back after round one. And Champions Cup, he was one back after round one and finished second. So out of those, like that small sample size I'm looking at, right? I'm only looking at eight majors, his, his last eight majors. Out of those last eight, only two, he really put himself in contention. And then one of those, he actually kind of pushed all the way to the end. The other one, he kind of blew up in the third round halfway through. But the majority of what I'm seeing from Ricky is he shoots himself out of it after the first round. So to me, that is going to be the most exciting round, the most like I'm going to be looking at how he's performing in round one because if he's only a couple back or heck, if he's in the lead, to me, it is now his tournament to lose. Um, so that will be very exciting, very interesting. We also have Gannon Burr playing in the tournament for the first time. We got a lot of guys that haven't played in the tournament playing in the tournament this year. So it should be a very, very exciting, uh, fun and exciting time. Um, one of the questions, too, on debate night coming up, which I think is a pretty fun question to answer, and I would love to hear your guys' uh, responses to this, is favorites to win, and then maybe some of the people that are a little bit under the radar, or if you want to call them dark horse picks, uh, to win. I think for me, Kristen Tatar and Gannon Burr, uh, alongside with Ricky are probably the favorites coming into the tournament. Um, the one person not a lot of people are talking about is Ezra, actually. Ezra, not Ezra Robinson, Ezra Aderholt. Uh, the dude finished third last year at this tournament. A lot of people are forgetting about that. A lot of people are forgetting that there was only two holes on that final round that he kind of had a hiccup on. Hole three, took a par on a par five. Uh, can't do that. I believe he actually had an eagle putt and ended up three putting. If my memory serves, um, he might have actually not three putted. He actually might have putted his eagle putt OB and then made the comebacker for par, I think is what ended up happening. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then hole 11 kind of blew up on hole 11 and took a double on that hole. Other than that, he probably would have won this tournament, which is kind of crazy. He's right there. So I like his chances a lot at this tournament. Now, obviously, them adding in a new course that does kind of spice it up. It kind of makes it a little bit different, but we'll see what he does. And I'll say this, and I said it on debate night. If anyone outside of this group right here wins, I'm going to give an OG get freaky to a listener. Kristen Tatar, Missy, Evelina, Henna, Silva, Paige, and Anakin. If anyone wins outside of that crew right there, those seven players, I will give away an OG get freaky to a listener. All right, President's Cup. The teams have been solidified. This is going down this Wednesday. In my opinion, this is much watch TV. This is if you like disc golf or if you're like, ah, I don't know, I don't really like watching live disc golf. I don't really, this is much watch. You got to tune into this. It's going to be exciting. You got Seppo and Yuli as the captains. On the FPO side for Europe, you got Kristen Tatar. And Evelina on the USA side, you got Missy and Ella. Ella, And then on Europe, you got Simon, Niklas, Vino, Jakob, Albert, Mari, Henna, and Yona are the two reserves. On the US side, you got Calvin, Gannon, Ricky, Eagle, Paul, AB, Paige, and Kyle Klein. To me, this is much watch, much CTV. I will be tuned in for sure to watch it. The only thing is, we've talked about before, I would have loved this tournament to have its own, own event. I think it belongs in its own event. It's big enough, it could do it. Uh, Eagle McMahon dropped a music video for his new disc golf, or his new disc release. I've got no comment. I think, <laughs> I say I have no comment and then I'm gonna say something. I think there's gonna be some people that really, really like it. I think there's gonna be some people that really, really don't like it. To me, though, I'm more in the middle of where I just like someone putting an effort for marketing, putting an effort for branding. I like it. I like that aspect. Is the song for me? Probably not. Um, but I like the effort. It was well produced, and I'll give him that. A cool stat here from the DG Fanatic over on X. Macbeth has cashed $1,731 at Crocole Open. 
Wysocki won and added $8,223 to his total winnings. And right now, he has closed the gap to $592. Macbeth has won $753,135 uh, career. And Ricky has won $752,543. That's absolutely crazy. Two guys that battled back and forth for nearly a decade, maybe over a decade at this point, are that close. That is something else. All right, no Edwin Stats or Manufacturer Cup updates this week, but we're going to jump right into our wild story of the week. And we didn't have any submissions. So this is just coming straight from uh, Reddit, straight from Disc Golf Reddit over there. So shout out again to those guys. And this is a lot of times we hear kind of, kind of some crazy stories about lost discs and how they get back to us or people texting people about their lost disc. This is a, this is a good one here. So it starts off saying, good afternoon. My name is blank. I have three little children, blank, blank and blank that came home with Frisbees that had your name and phone number on them. And I'm not sure how they got them, but if you could please give me a call if they need to be returned to you, I'd appreciate giving me all I would like. Uh, I'd appreciate giving me all I would like to find out how these kids got these nice Frisbees. Thank you. Uh, the person responds, oh, hey, I was practicing disc golf at Blank Park yesterday and mind my own business and, there were, and they were showing such a keen interest in how the disc flew. It's been a great hobby for me and just as I was leaving, I had a few discs I don't use very much and have them and gave each one of them a disc. I didn't ask their names, but they were so respectful and kind, especially the young man. He came up to me and shook my hand to say thank you and thought that it was really cool. I've got four kids of my own and they think it's fun to play with the basket we have in the backyard. Hope that helps to clear things up. Also happy to chat if you want to give me a call. They responded, thank you very much for your quick response and your kindness towards my children. I will let them know of their respective, respect, respective ways, which means a lot. He responded, you, you bet, appreciate you reaching out. Have a great weekend. So what a wonderful story that was. Absolutely incredible. A lot of times, like I said, we see some nasty stuff set from some people or heck, we get someone saying, hey, uh, this disc ended up at this course. Is it yours? And you're like, wow, someone took my disc and played with it and lost it in a different course. And so there's a lot of that, but um, that was really cool. Another thing I want to say, uh, talk a little Hall of Fame real quick. This was another thing uh, posed on debate night coming up on Thursday. So definitely tune in Thursday to, or maybe does it drop Wednesday now? I don't even know. I think it drops Wednesday or Thursday. I don't know. But debate night, uh, we're going to be talking about Hall of Fame and what we think should be changed with the Hall of Fame. Should it be changed? Do people, do people respect it? Who currently right now would be in the Hall of Fame? Um, I'm just going to throw out one name that is like a no-brainer to me. I, or, I'll throw out two names that are no-brainer. I think you could throw Paul McBeth in there and Simon Lazat. I'll throw those two out. All right, we're going to jump real quick here to listener questions. Listener questions I pose again over on X. If you guys aren't following Tour Life on Twitter, go make sure you go over and give us a follow. I normally always ask Tuesday morning for your questions. So if you want to ask us something to be answered here on the podcast, that is how you do it. Uh, this is coming from Jason Hockey 77 with Tatar's contract ending this next year, do you see possibility where she could end up somewhere other than Latitude? With someone like Kristen Tatar, you do everything you can to keep them in your company. You roll out all the red carpets, you do whatever it takes to keep them in your company. This is not just a top player, this is an irreplaceable player currently in the FPO. There is not anyone that brings what she brings to the table right now. And you got to keep her. You got to do everything you can. Now, does Latitude have the funds to do that? I don't know. We'll see. But in my opinion, I think if Kristen goes anywhere other than Latitude, it's on Latitude for dropping the ball there. Uh, Dr. Dude wants to know what my favorite milk is. It's skim milk. Derek Accour says, you often compare disc golf to ball golf. How far away is the DGPT from having FPO and MPO on separate weekends and or having half the field start on hole 10 to help pace a play? 
So we've answered this before, FPO, MPO, I don't think they're close at all. There really needs to come a time where FPO is like, listen, you, MPO, you are actually holding us back. That is when they need to separate. I don't think that's anywhere near in the future. And to answer your second question, I have no idea why they have not started doing this. I've talked about it multiple times to the to, to people that could implement it on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I, I've never given a reason of why they don't. And for those that are wondering, like, what does that mean? Right now, when the first tee time goes off, let's say the first tee time goes off at 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, there are only four players on the course. The next tee time goes off at 7.15. At 7.15, there are now eight players on the course. The majority of the course is wide open. No one is on it. So what this is saying is you have someone tee off at one or at, on hole one at seven o'clock and you have another group tee off on hole 10 at seven o'clock. So then at 7.15 or 7.12, you now have not eight, but you now have 16 people on the course. And you do it in a way to where as people are getting to hole nine, everyone has already teed off on hole 10. So everyone is in, and all of a sudden you have all 18 holes covered in half the time where before it would take you twice as long to have someone on all 18 holes. There you have it. Uh, next up is Dark and Stormy. They want to know, you mentioned to watch out for Eliezra once she realizes she doesn't have to throw 70 miles per hour every throw. Do you think there's a correlation there with AB going down tempo to bunch to, to going down tempo a bunch this year? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. There was multiple times this past week where I saw AB taking a slower disc or I saw AB going for a placement shot rather than just trying to throw as far as he possibly can. And that is something that his distance is definitely a huge advantage. And I see that this year we're seeing him utilize it in a way to that and that utilize it as a crutch. Love seeing it. Very, very smart play out of AB. It also helps that he's putting really well. He's got that stepper going this season. Uh, this is from CW Viking. Have you ever played uh, the new NCAA football yet? I have not. I don't have a PS5. I think I sold all my gaming systems, so I don't currently have anything to play it. And right now with how things are going, uh, with the personal life, the business, uh, disc golf, everything, I got no time for it. Um, maybe a couple years from now, I'll have a little bit more time to maybe pop it in and play some, but right now I've got no time, so I don't feel like I'm missing out at all. Just a rando 321 says, should part twos be a thing on short holes, 150 feet to 180 feet? Absolutely not. TF advance, should players sell ad space on the flight plate of their discs? I feel like that is a missed opportunity for both pulling outside sponsors and players making more money. For example, Bushnell could play, could pay you to have three of your discs always have their logo. This is an interesting idea for sure. Um, the only thing I would say pushback wise is this would only make sense for the eyeballs actually on the course. The amount of time we get to see the top of the disc is very minimal. And also it'd be very difficult a lot of times to even um, be able to uh, make out what that is without asking it. So to me, I still think the hat, side of the hat, shoulder, chest, back of the shirt, all those areas I think are going to be the prime areas for marketing and advertising. I don't think the disc is going to really work out too well. And if it does, it would be at a very, very small uh, fraction of what you would get for stuff you would put on your apparel. Final question, or two questions here. We got what up spirit. Is it worth it to play the amateur majors or is it just to get your name out there and potential sponsors? So I don't really know what your question is asking. Uh, I don't think there is any harm in playing the amateur majors. I don't see if money isn't an issue, travel, all those things isn't an issue and you want to play disc golf. I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, and to your point, yes, it's a hundred percent a good opportunity if you are looking to potentially play uh, and be a touring professional and get sponsored. It is a great way to get your name out there 100%. All right, Will Edge sent me a pretty long one here. I was watching the live stream on Sunday and on hole 16 and noticed something interesting. I was curious if this was standard procedure to not consult a spotter. 
a player, no idea who, had his disc land near the basket, then bounce and finally roll OB. The spotter marked the OB spot accurately with the flag in the ground about 20 feet from the basket, then walked to the other side of the green. When the players arrived, they saw the flag, but then said it must have gone out there, certainly, pointing to a spot 5 to 10 feet from the basket, and the player threw it in from there. I assume this was legal as it's car decision. However, is it standard uh, practice to simply ignore and consult a spotter? I feel like this would be a huge deal in, di in golf. So, right now, spotters aren't actual officials. We've only I've only ever played one tournament where the spotter actually was an official, and that was on a blind Mando hole where we physically could not see if the disc uh, cleared the Mando or didn't. And so the spotter would make the call and we would have to go off of that call. Now, why is that any different to these scenarios? We're throwing discs 400 feet away. We have no idea where it really crossed. Majority of the time, we don't even have a great angle to see. And a lot of times too, disc does weird things at the end. It could have easily rolled, rolled OB and then hit something and rolled another direction. And now all of a sudden you're like, well, my disc is here. It had to have gone out of bounds here. So to me, I look at two things. I look at how quick is the spotter making their decision? And then I also look at, did the spotter actually have a good viewpoint on where the disc crossed? If those two things happen, I take the spotter's spot 100%, no questions asked. And I wish other people did too. There are people notorious on tour that will fight for five, 10 feet every single time, even when they have no idea where they went out of bounds because no one saw it and the spotter put a flag somewhere. It absolutely grinds my gears, but it is what it is. People are always going to try to take advantage. Um, this week in Foundation Disc Golf, we just got a restock on Zone OS Disc. So go over to foundationdisc.com, check it out. Some nice Zone OS Disc over there. And I got no updates for Tour Life merch or anything like that. And that was a rapid fire. I don't know if you guys liked it. It was quick. It was to the point. I didn't have a uh, co-host this time to kind of banter back and forth with. I just gave you the facts and gave you my opinion on those facts. And that was Tour Life this week. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, well, Yuli will be back next year. We'll have some guests on. Hopefully the winners of the European Open. If the, uh, the time constraints and all that work in our favor. And until then, have a good one.